Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm extremely pleased to welcome you because this is one of the few seminars we've had as part of the assessment of China's BRI project, which we've been able to hold in person. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, so it's an important, important day for us at the project because the one and a half year that I've been at UVA, almost everything's been online. So it's wonderful to see people uh, here. And today's a very special uh, seminar that we have. We have an excellent team here, a very accomplished team here from the A Data Project at William and Mary. For those of you who do not know about the A Data Project, they created or they ruffled a lot of feathers uh, a couple of months ago when they released this large tranche of data, almost 14 odd thousand projects that are financed by the Chinese. Uh, and this report raised a lot of uh, very pertinent questions in terms of China's fundings uh, across different parts of the world. Uh, as I said, we've got three eminent speakers. We've got Charlie <coughs> Fox over here, who is the executive director of the A-Data project at William & Mary. Um, Brad has a PhD in international relations from London School of Economics. Uh, then we've got Amar Malik, who is the senior research scientist at A-Data. They'll be presenting one paper. And then we've got Sam Custer, who is going to present another paper as well. Sam is the Director of Policy Analysis at A-Data. So in one ticket, we'll get two very interesting shows today. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming the William & Mary team. This presentation is going to be by Sam, uh, by uh, Amar and Brad, or only Amar? I'm going to start first. and then Brad right. will. So let me just get this. Well, as Tayyip mentioned, uh, in September of last year, we released uh, a new data set. Um, thank you. Perfect. Um, okay. Yeah, just want to make sure. And the title that you see here is the title of a policy report that uh, accompanied the release of the data set. Um, Banking on the Belt and Road, insights from a new global data set of 13,427 Chinese development projects. Uh, I'll start off with giving you a little bit of background of, about the data and what we do and why we do what we do. And then Brad is going to walk us through some of the key findings. Uh, and then we look forward to your questions later on. So a data has about 35 uh, staff. We were just talking at, at lunch about this. Uh, we have uh, program evaluators, policy people, our communications and media relations team, uh, partnerships team is also um, uh, quite a force. Um, and uh, we have uh, three uh, units uh, that for, focus on three uh, distinct areas. Uh, Sam leads the policy analysis unit. I lead the Chinese development finance uh, program, um, which uh, is responsible for this work. And um, then we have the research and evaluation unit uh, read by uh, Ariel Panyashe, which does a lot of geospatial uh, uh, impact evaluations, which is also a, a very interesting and up and coming area for ADA. Uh, we've been around for um, about 18 years um, and we already um, have expertise in underreported financial flows, uh, causal inference methods, survey methods, and you'll hear uh, bits and pieces of that today. Um, so, in terms of the background, we call it the ADA's Global Chinese Development Finance Data Set version 2.0, is, and that's because the first version was released in 2017, um, and now we've dramatically expanded and improved on, on that by giving a much larger coverage. Uh, so really the purpose of this, as, you, as some of you may know, unlike um, countries that participate or foreign you know, donor, donor countries in the Western Hemisphere, participate in um, reporting to the OECD or other international bodies on what their aid activities are like. Uh, China does not participate in those processes. So really this is a quest to try to understand how much money is flowing where, and then to try to standardize it to the standards that have been set by the OECD's Development Assistance Committee so that people could do all apples to apples comparisons with, uh, with uh, uh, between Chinese development finance and other more traditional donors. Uh, so our North Star is very much trying to support this, what we think of this as like a public, global public good that enables evidence-based policy making because you can't, you can't say much about something which you, you can't measure or you don't know much about. So this is very much in our, uh, in our wheelhouse. Uh, our data, as you can see in a minute, is comprehensive, it's reliable, 
Uh, we invest a lot of time in quality assurance. It is granular in its nature and we are expanding both on spatial and temporal dimensions. And that opens up a lot of opportunities for applied analytics. Um, so we cover, for example, um, first of all, we cover all official sector financial flows from China um, that align with the OECD's criteria of ODA and OF, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the, I've mentioned the we're close to 14,000 projects now, and uh, these projects are worth $843 billion, and they're across 165 countries. So the way to think about this is this is basically covering all lower income, lower middle income, middle income countries um, around the world. So it's a, it's a massive effort. And we cover um, the 18 years of financial commitments, projects that were committed between 2000 and 2017, um, and the implementation details or the actual current details on what's happening on the ground are current for the entire duration up until 2021. So even if a project was committed in 2017 or 2016, sometimes these projects takes time to get off the ground. So you'll get the current status of every project uh, as of last year. Um, we, um, if, just to give you an idea of the scale, uh, we identified over 300 official sector financial institutions from China. Um, over 2,400 borrowing or recipient institutions, uh, as well as 460 co-financers. We also identified a number of third parties. You can think of what we call the accountable agencies. Uh, these are agencies that provide guarantees or credit insurance or collateral to make some of these deals happen, uh, especially on the, on the lending side. And of course, uh, over 3,500 implementation institutions. These are contractors and uh, subcontractors and so on. Um, in terms of what we cover, it's, a, it's about 70 variables and fields. Um, you can go to Adata's website right now and download the spreadsheet, but I'll walk you through the big areas, which I think uh, would help you understand some of the uh, opportunities for research. So we cover uh, details of the financial institutions that are involved, uh, recipient borrower institutions. For loans, you will see we have interest rates, maturities, grace periods, commitment fees, and management fees. Um, we also calculate level of financial concessionality, which becomes very, very important. Um, insurance uh, uh, repayment guarantees. And then very importantly, we have three digit OECD sector codes. So you can, then again, as I said, you can compare health projects with health projects. So if you wanna do US China comparisons or Australia, US China, et cetera, that gives you a lot of detail. And then we also have invested a lot in this version of the data set in get, getting more precise with the dates. So moving from just years to the extent possible to go to the exact date when a project was uh, announced, uh, inaugurated, completed. And then similarly, we have invested a ton of time in getting more spatial precision. So now instead of telling you that a given project is in a given district of a country, we can uh, tell you exactly where it is. So if it's a transmission line, it's a line, if it's a power, plant, it's, it's, like a, it's like a drawing. Uh, and all of this is available freely for people to download and use. The, uh, the tough methodology, the tracking under reported financial flows methodology is something that was pioneered at Aid Data. Um, this is what underlies it. And just to give you an idea of how we actually go about collecting this wealth of information, you know, we have a team of over 100 uh, people, uh, faculties, a few staff members, but a lot of this work is done by student RAs. Um, and uh, in a given semester, our, you know, uh, our numbers fluctuate, but it's quite a large operation. Uh, we do this uh, first and foremost by uh, looking at uh, a wide range of uh, official sources and also unofficial sources. We look into grant and loan agreements that are published by uh, governments. Uh, aid and debt information management systems, annual reports, uh, and then sometimes World Bank and IMF reports as well. And when we have gaps in our understanding of what those deals are, what the details are, uh, that's when some of the unofficial sources come in handy. All in all, our data set is backed by over 91,000 sources. And uh, on average, there's about seven sources per project and almost 90% of the projects have at least one official source. So you can be sure that the data is coming from authentic sources. Uh, this is just to give you a, an example of the kind of original unredacted loan agreements that we found. Um, uh, as part of a previous project, um, Brad and colleagues uh, published uh, 100 loan agreements. Uh, the report is called How China Lends. And it was just a, a, a landmark in our understanding of how the legal side of things work. Uh, and maybe Brad can touch upon some of this. But just to give you an idea that on Adata's website, even now, if you go and search, 
for your favorite countries or for your favorite sectors, chances are that you'll stumble upon some original role agreements. Some are in English, many are in French and Spanish, but I think it's worth, uh, worth looking into these because it gives you a fascinating insights into how some of these uh, agreements work. Uh, Brad? All right, so I'm gonna uh, just give you an overview of some of the uh, top line findings from uh, the analysis of, uh, of the data set. So um, just to jump right in, uh, you know, Amar uh, referenced the fact that the data set has this crosswalk to OECD spending. So the OECD categorizes any official sector financial flow as either official development assistance, that's like the conventional definition for foreign aid, so that's ODA, and then they have this other category that's inelegantly called OOF, which stands for other official flows. And you can think of that as like commercial debt or export credits. So uh, what we found is that um, China is now outspending the, the US on a more than two to one basis. In a typical year during the Belt and Road era, China's spending about $85 billion and the US is spending less than half of that, about 37 billion. But the color of the money, the composition of the spending is dramatically different. Um, so if you look at this graph in the bottom uh, right-hand corner, um, you know, what you'll see is that over time, the US has for the most part gotten out of the lending business. They almost exclusively provide grants or funding on highly concessional terms. China has gone in the opposite direction. So whereas at the turn of the century, they had kind of a balanced portfolio, more balanced portfolio of grants and loans. Now they've really shifted um, towards loans, mostly dollar and euro denominated loans and mostly uh, priced at or near market terms. So most of China's overseas lending is either uh, non-concessional or semi-concessional uh, in, in nature. So the ratio of their spending in any given year during the Belt and Road era is about um, $9 of OOF, that kind of commercial lending for every $1 of ODA. And it's kind of upside down for the US and its Western allies. They'll spend um, you know, a, roughly $9 of ODA for every dollar of o OOF. Um, in terms of the, the pricing of the lending, there's also a pretty wide gap, right? That reflects the intent, right? To either provide financing on concessional terms or commercial terms. So uh, the, the weighted average interest rate of a overseas loan from China is over 4%, it's 4.2%. The average uh, repayment period, average maturity length is just under 10 years. Um, if you look at the, the remaining Western creditors that are that are still in the lending business they haven't moved i mean some of them like the us have moved almost exclusively to grants but those who are still lending are germany france japan they are lending um, much lower interest rates longer repayment periods so a typical loan nowadays if you're going to borrow from japan or germany or france is going to be one percentage point or a, a, a one percent interest rate typical repayment period is going to be uh, somewhere around 28 years. So if you kind of plug that into a concessionality calculator, a grant element calculator, you know, many of these, uh, many of these loans from the Western creditors are, uh, you know, somewhere around 50% or 75% grant elements um, in their loans. Uh, we also found in the analysis of the data set that um, during the BRI era, one of the things that has changed is more green lighting of mega projects, which we defined as projects that are financed with loans worth $500 million or more. So there's a tripling uh, number of mega projects that have been uh, approved since BRI was announced. And in order to finance these very large projects, we also see a shift away from bilateral lending, I, one lender, one borrower, to lending via club loans and syndicated loans. So now, you know, we're offering multi-billion dollar loans. And so we're going to pull, pull together a syndicate where there's 20 banks, right? We all owe, or we all own a fraction of the debt. And that's a risk, um, a risk sharing uh, mechanism. And it's not always exclusively Chinese syndicates. Sometimes it's, you know, 50% of the debt is owned by China, but Citibank's in there, the World Bank's in there. So, um, that is a key feature. The average size of these syndicated loans is about $1.3 billion. So pretty, pretty substantial. And this is all to facilitate 
these kind of big ticket infrastructure projects under the auspices of the Belgian Road Initiative. The other thing that is kind of unique about this data set is, you know, Amar mentioned there's over 300 donors and lenders just from China that are captured in the data set and they are classified by type. And so one of the things that we're able to do is differentiate between what's going on with lending from the policy banks, which we often hear about China Exim Bank, China Development Bank. But what if we compare that to the state-owned commercial banks? Now we finally have visibility on the state-owned commercial banks. And what we find is there's been, uh, whereas the, the growth in lending from the policy banks has been minimal during the BRI era, there's been a dramatic ramping up in lending from uh, the state-owned commercial banks. So this is like ICBC, Bank of China, China Construction Bank, five-fold increase from these banks. And many of them are the participants in these, uh, these syndicated loans. Um, Amar also alluded to the fact that every one of the loans um, allows you to track uh, repayment safeguards or, or credit enhancements that are put in place to in maximize the likelihood that the loan will be repaid. So that allows us to kind of look at um, what tools does China prefer um, to protect their bottom line. And what we find is um, when you look at um, all three safeguards that are tracked in the data set, credit insurance from Sinusure, uh, an independent uh, third-party repayment guarantee from an entity other than the borrower, or the provision of a source of collateral that can be seized in the event of a default. If you kind of collapse all those together and just say, what percentage of the lending benefits from any one of those three protection mechanisms, um, you, you basically see a doubling from 30% of the portfolio to now 60% of the portfolio that benefits from at least one of those. Across those three repayment safeguards, um, the Chinese lenders have a special uh, preference for collateral as the mechanism by which um, they, they uh, maximize the likelihood of repayment. So 44% of the loan portfolio is collateralized, um, but contrary to what we hear from policymakers and uh, elite media, they uh, really rarely collateralize on physical illiquid assets like a seaport or an airport or an electricity grid. They are way savvier than that. So they prefer to collateralize on liquid assets, typically cash. They'll ask a borrower to deposit foreign currency in a lender controlled bank account that they can unilaterally seize in the event that the borrower falls into arrears or uh, goes into default. And if you think about that, smart because if you identify a source of collateral that's physical and it's in a foreign jurisdiction you're gonna to have to go to court to try to recover an overdue debt and heaven forbid liquidate you know a, a, an asset a, a physical asset uh overseas so rather than doing that they just they retain control and they have in legal parlance set off rights which means as the bank if you control the bank account you can unilaterally debit the account without ever having to go before a judge to try to recover, um, recover the debt. Um, so that's a key kind of uh, something that came out of the data set that really kind of punctured a major myth about the way that China, uh, China lends. Another thing that we find is, uh, you know, when you look at the cross country distribution of Chinese lending, it's a head scratcher. Like why are they lending boatloads of money to these countries that many other lenders would say, I don't want to touch that country with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> you know, they have risk written all over them. I'm going to lend billions of dollars to Turkmenistan and Equatorial Guinea and Venezuela. Like, why are they doing this? And I think what the, what the data show just through the descriptive statistics is that there is a method to the madness, right? So they have come up with these very clever mechanisms to minimize risk in highly risky environments. So if you look at these countries, so 83% of the lending that is collateralized goes to the highest risk countries. So what, what's going on here? What's going on is that most of these loans are being collateralized against natural resource export receipts. Okay, And so what that means is when you sign a loan contract, on the very same day, you sign a sister agreement, which is a commodity sales and purchase agreement. And what that does is it says, look, I'm not only going to extend a loan to you, 
we're going to sign a commodity sales agreement where you're going to agree to sell me, let's say, oil or gas for the next 20 years at these prices. And when you send me, the when the tankers of uh, full of oil arrive in Beijing, instead of remitting payment to the treasury in risky country X, I'm going to expunge risk from the equation. There will never be a cross-border financial flow. I'm going to take the money that you earned, the dollars and euros that you earned for the oil and gas that showed up at my shores, and I'm going to deposit it in a Beijing-based bank account. Actually, there's going to be two escrow accounts. The first escrow account is going to be used to service the debt, right? The second account is going to be the collateral account. It's a minimum cash balance, right? That's the, I call it a, a grab and go asset, right? That the bank can take in the event that you turn out to not be a good borrower. Um, another uh, top line finding from the report has to do with hidden debt. So what we find is that the, the authorities in Beijing really found themselves in a pickle when BRI was announced at the end of 2013. There had already been a dramatic increase in overseas lending to foreign governments through Chinese banks. And so put yourself in the shoes of um, the uh, uh, a bank, a Chinese state-owned bank or a government official. Now Xi Jinping says, okay, we're gonna go out and we're gonna ramp up lending overseas. Well, a lot of these governments had already received huge amounts of Chinese debt. They didn't have a lot of appetite to take on more. They can only, you know, you can only take so much onto the government's balance sheet. So that's a problem, right? Because we're supposed to be ramping up at a time where there's not demand to absorb that debt. So they got creative. And what they decided to do was, we're not gonna extend credit to the sovereign. We're going to extend credit to state-owned banks, state-owned enterprises. We're gonna set a lend to joint ventures. We're gonna create special legal entities called special purpose vehicles. We're gonna lend to those. And then we're going to have repayment safeguards that come from the host government, it's kind of forms of liability protection, a sovereign guarantee, for example, that in the event that this special legal entity that we set up at the borrowing as the borrowing institution, as the borrowing institution, if they go belly up, well, then uh, the government uh, steps in and, and assumes responsibility for the debt. So, you know, we kind of describe this in the report as the fall of sovereign debt and the rise of hidden public debt, right? So the problem with a lot of these debts um, is that they are advertised ex ante as private, but ex post, they often reveal themselves to be public, right? Once these borrowers are in distress, that's really when you learn, is the debt truly private or public? And so we're sort of watching this now in real time. And what we're learning is a lot of these loans that were marketed as private debts are actually public. So the poster child is the Bandung, uh, the Jakarta Bandung High Speed Railway, $4 billion loan from China Development Bank. The president of Indonesia issued a decree promising that no taxpayer resources would be used to repay this loan. They set up a special purpose vehicle and all the lending went to this legal entity. Five years later, the railway's not built, it's not generating revenue, they can't repay the loan, and the president quietly issues a follow-up decree saying, never mind, we're authorizing a bailout using treasury funds, we're gonna move money from the public treasury into this, um, this special purpose vehicle to repay the debt. So I like to say hidden public debt is like a, you know, a thief coming to rob the treasury. It's not gonna knock on the front door and say, hey, we're here, it's gonna come through the back door and leave no fingerprints. To this day, right, the, the Indonesian president did not say that that infusion of cash from the treasury was to repay the loan to China, right? He just did a cash transfer to a legal entity. The only reason that legal entity exists is to repay uh, China Development Bank. Um, we also look at a kind of a close cousin of hidden debt, which is underreported debt. Um, so there's a registry, an international registry to record uh, the, the public debt obligations of low income and middle income governments. It's been in place since uh, the end of World War II. It's called the debtor reporting system. And so our data set provided, and it's disaggregated by uh, creditor. And so our data set provided an opportunity to say, well, what are the Chinese debts that sovereigns are reporting into the international reporting system and then what have we captured through this new data set? And what we found was that 
um, there's $385 billion of public debt exposure to China that is not being reported by, by low-income and middle-income governments into the principal system responsible for capturing these debts. Um, so that works out on average to the equivalent of about 5.8% of host country GDP. So these are non, uh, it's a non-trivial uh, problem and it's get, getting worse, not better <laughs> with the passage of time. So, you know, this is what we're describing is very much a PRI phenomenon because you're deliberately lending off the government's uh, books. And so uh, this is borne out in the descriptive statistics. We find that, um, you know, the, in, a, in a typical year, the uh, amount of underreporting of repayment liabilities to official sector uh, creditors in China pre-BRI is about $13 billion a year. It's, it's roughly triple that uh, during the BRI era. There's also, um, I'll pass, pass the baton here in just a moment, there's a separate section of the report that's not so much on the financing side, it's more about what's happening in implementation. So the data set provides rich details, quantitative and qualitative details on um, uh, the implementation of these projects. And what we find is that roughly a third of the portfolio is in trouble um, for one reason or another. So we have, um, the data set has project descriptions. Those project descriptions, if you stitch them together, they are uh, the equivalent of 2 million words. It's like 18 or 19 full length books. So that creates opportunities to do some pretty sophisticated keywords, uh, keyword search, um, keyword searching to sort of systematically categorize which projects are affected by which types of problems. And what we find is that um, about a third of the portfolio has run into serious uh, problems related to corruption, labor violations, environmental hazards or uh, public protests. Um, we're also seeing an increase in uh, project suspensions and cancellations in the pre-BRI era as compared to um, the, the earlier era. And increasingly, we're seeing host country policymakers um, that were initially kind of eager to jump on the BRI bandwagon are now trying to create distance um, from their, their Chinese patrons um, because of um, the, the fact that the kind of political opinion, uh, public sentiment in their country when it shifts against China because uh, some of these projects are uh, causing problems that become can very quickly become a political liability for leaders. And so many times they will say, okay, now we're gonna go back and revisit this project or mothball it um, or, or rescope it in, in some way. So we call that, uh, that this kind of empirical phenomenon, BRI buyer's remorse. And we estimate that there's somewhere between two dozen and three dozen countries that are experiencing some version of, uh, of buyer's remorse. So with that, I am gonna hand things over uh, for round, uh, the, the second part of the double header. <laughs> All right, so before, so I was gonna jive right in, but before I do, I wanna do a gut check with you. So how many of you in the room study or research China? Raise your hand. Good amount of you. How many of you study or research financing for development or finance? Okay, fewer of you. All right, um, so I wanna take a step back then. So why does all of this great stuff matter? Why does this data set matter if you don't study financing for development or finance? All of the information that, that, that Brad and Amar uh, told you is useful because China, if you read in the news, you know that China is a major um, exporter, right? And so they've, they've racked up um, tons and tons of trade surpluses over the last two decades. You know what that's built up? A $3.3 trillion foreign currency reserve pretty substantial amount of money that you can use to bankroll uh, development around the world and be able to advance your national interests. What that's looked like in practice is that those different countries that Brad and Amar were talking about in terms of those that are having BRI projects, it's positioned China to be the single largest official creditor in the world particularly in emerging countries, which as Brad and, and Amar alluded to, are actually racking up debts that can approach 40 to 50% of their GDP. So this is pretty substantial. And so the question that animates a lot of scholars 
even if you don't care about financing for development, which I do, but if you didn't, even if, if you didn't care about that, you'd be curious about, well, how can China then translate this amazing resource into influence? And so that is what I do. And, and I think this is helpful for you to think about because we want you to use this great data that Brad and Amar talked about as an input into your research projects. And so think of this, this two-part series as the input and the application, and this is just one of them. Um, and so in this, this um, paper, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this idea of corridors of power. So how does China use economics and soft power to exert influence to advance economic, geopolitical, um, and security goals? But before I dive into the findings, especially if you're not like actively looking at this day in and day out, let's think for a minute about some discrete examples that perhaps are familiar to you as you think about how does Beijing and China try to exert influence around the world? You can think about a local Confucius Institute. You can think about a state-backed infrastructure project. You can think about a Chinese diplomat using Twitter to promote pro-China narratives, and there are many, many more examples, right? But despite these visible signs, we have fairly minimal details on specifics, not just on the finance side, but on all of these different examples of influence. And we, we don't really know how to answer the questions like, which countries or communities are receiving more of Beijing's attention and why? And how well can Beijing actually translate this economic and soft power um, activities into realized influence that matters with foreign publics and foreign leaders? And so what happens here is absent this hard evidence, it becomes difficult to separate fact from fiction. And so we basically can't answer the question, who is Beijing seeking to influence how and to what effect? So this uh, Corridors of Power report is actually the fourth in a series of reports that we've done to date to try to close this evidence gap on China's influence playbook in over 40 countries in the Asia Pacific region. And in this particular report, Corridors of Power, we are focusing on how China uses its tools to build economic, social, and network ties, particularly in 13 South and Central Asia countries over a two decade period. And we looked not only at the differences in China's approach between countries, but also within countries. And because China, China's public diplomacy doesn't occur in a vacuum, we're also interested in looking at perceptions of China, not in isolation, but relative to how they think about Russia, the US and the UK and India. Okay, so let's look at uh, economic ties uh, first. So economic opportunity, you've probably heard this or read it. Um, it's often cited as the, the primary explanation for what attracts countries to want to engage with China. And this is true whether you're talking about leaders who see infrastructure as a gateway to growth for their countries, or it can be for citizens who see China as important to their livelihoods. They're uh, bringing jobs, they're offering capital, they're brokering connections. But as Brad and Omar alluded to, these economic ties can also constrict autonomy of action, right? It can create obligations to back Beijing's preferred policies, avoid criticism of its actions, and grant political and security concessions. And so in this particular report, we look at one particular economic tool that China employs. I call it financial diplomacy, but this is essentially um, uh, using the great official finance data that Brad and Omar already talked about. Um, so how does China use this financial diplomacy, all of this economic heft? So we looked in the report at four different categories of economic assistance, two that are particularly visible to foreign publics. So this would be infrastructure and financing and humanitarian aid. And then two that are highly prized by foreign leaders, budget support and debt relief. And so what we find in this particular region of the 13 countries over a two decade period, Beijing deployed $127 billion in financial diplomacy across South and Central Asia. And this was primarily in the form of debt financing, as Brad and Amara alluded to, and oriented to infrastructure. And it makes you think for a moment, okay, if you spread that out equally, okay, I have a picture of what China's doing. Well, you'd be wrong because China is heavily concentrated and strategic in how it uses these investments. Would it surprise you to know that two countries out of those 13 actually accounted for over half of those financial diplomacy dollars during the period. Most of its financing was actually concentrated in two pretty large investments, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor and the China-Central Asia Gas Pipeline in Kazakhstan. But if you look under the hood, uh, in terms of how China is employing this, this financial diplomacy, we see certain strategies emerging. So Central Asian countries, along with Pakistan and Nepal, they tend to attract a relatively greater supply of China's economic relative to soft power overtures at the local level. 
And the common denominator of these countries is that they tend to have a higher number of districts which offer ready supplies of energy via oil, natural gas, hydropower power potential, which is perhaps unsurprising if you read the news and you see here how hungry for energy China is. But also these communities tend to have more strategic positioning to Beijing's overland or maritime trade routes. Comparatively in other countries like India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, China places relatively more weight on soft power overtures, which I'll get into in a little bit, um, and trying to nudge countries along to improve attitudes towards Beijing. Okay, but there's, this actually obscures even a little bit more of the strategy behind China's approach. So if you look beyond national boundaries, we find evidence that China views some communities as particularly more strategic in advancing its interests than others. And we actually find that Beijing targeted 62%, so 78 billion of that 127 billion, to just 25 provinces. And 41% of all of that money to just 25 districts. So in practice, the top three province level recipients of financial diplomacy from China over a two decade period captured more money than seven of the 13 countries in that same region. Think of it like three Virginias. So across the region, communities that were most likely to attract China's financial diplomacy dollars had a certain set of attributes to them. They were strategically positioned near natural gas pipelines for energy security, and they were more populous metropolitan areas um, that present really lucrative markets for Chinese goods, capital, supplies. Um, but that's not all they're doing. They're also focusing on uh, developing social ties. So you might say that China's cultural distance from South Asia or for Central Asia would likely hinder uptake of Chinese language and norms. But there's a sense that economic cooperation might be enough of an enticement or an incentive to change that status quo. So in the report, we examined how China uses a combination of soft power tools, such as educational cooperation and student exchange, language and cultural promotion, city level diplomacy to stoke closer social ties. And we also compare these efforts to other foreign powers. Okay, so what we find is that Chinese leaders have pretty effectively synchronized educational assistance, language and cultural promotion, and scholarships to feed prospective students into its higher education institutions and deliver vocational training. Over a two decade period, for example, China bankrolled 251 educational assistance projects worth $6.6 .6 billion. And this assistance took a variety of forms, hardware, so constructing buildings and donating equipment, software, so scholarships, training, and technical assistance, as well as some joint research and knowledge products, projects. What's interesting is that the 2008 uh, financial crisis internationally and the 2013 announcement of the Belt and Road Initiative were really important inflection points if we look over history. There's a marked uptick in the overall volume of these soft power projects, which is not always thought about when we think about the Belt and Road, we kind of think about infrastructure, but there's this soft power, these people to people ties are equally important here. You see an uptick at each uh, inflection point. So 2000 to 2008, 61 projects. By 2013, we're up to 82 projects. By 2017, we're looking at 108 projects. So you're seeing increase uh, over time. But you also see a shift in the types of projects that China's investing in here. You're seeing a shift away from constructing buildings and donating equipment to more emphasis on scholarships, training, and technical assistance. Okay, um, but what else is China doing? We looked at three strategies that Beijing employs to compete with traditional study abroad destinations, like the US, for example, loosening visa restrictions, offering state-backed scholarships, and reducing language barriers through expanding English language uh, options to study in China. So visa requirements, we're looking at things like fees, health requirements, proof of students ability to cover their personal financial expenses. If you're an international student or have studied abroad, you're very familiar with these things. Um, all of these things increase the friction in both cost and time of what it takes for somebody to study in your country. We did a head to head comparison of how easy it would be if you were a student in South or Central Asia to study in China versus other popular educational destinations. My, primarily the US, the UK, and Russia. And we found that between these foreign powers, China offers the least burdensome visa requirements in cost, health requirements, proof of payment for students from most countries in the region. And Beijing matched these loose visa requirements with 10,000 scholarships uh, to, for students to study in China across the region. 
Um, South Asia receives more of these scholarships, but if you look per capita, Central Asia is a major focus here. But Afghanistan is actually the single most heavily subsidized country in the world. A quarter of Afghan students that study in China do so on the Chinese government's back bankroll. Um, it's useful to think about this in comparison because this is not only something that is in the, the China, uh, China's influence playbook, this is something that the US and the UK have done for a long time. And so how do they compare? Um, we look at this in, the ter in terms of promotion of language and culture. So promotion of Mandarin language versus promotion of Russian or, or promotion of English. And we found that even though China got into this game of promoting language and culture fairly late, if you look at the US and the UK or even Russia, there are examples of this back in the early 1900s. By contrast, China's first um, Confucius Institute was established in 2004, so fairly more recent, right? But now China has the second largest share of these language and cultural promotion centers across the region. Um, and it's looking at this both at the university level in terms of Confucius Institutes, but also at the primary and um, high school level. So you can have Confucius kindergarten. Um, and there's very, there's an indication that China is going to be doubling down on this in the future um, when it comes to vocational training. So some of you may have heard in the news that um, there have been huge protests in countries in response to this idea that China is importing uh, Chinese labor to work on these projects. And so China recognizes this, they need to sidestep this criticism. And so they've come out with a strategy called Luban workshops, which pair Chinese firms with Chinese higher education solutions and a local host institution in another country to do this vocational training. And so it's a way of responding to the criticism, but you're providing this training on Chinese systems, Chinese technology, Chinese standards. So you're actually creating the future market for your commercial goods. Um, I mentioned before that when you look at uh, financial diplomacy or the economic tools of power, China is actually fairly concentrated. It's not, um, it's not equally putting attention everywhere. And the same thing is true in terms of the social ties. So we actually looked at the subnational level and identified 193 touch points between the Chinese government and cities in this region. So we looked at 174 cities where there was um, some indication of ties. So we looked at sister city agreements. Um, so the twin uh, cities in one country with another. Um, we looked at the presence of Mandarin language testing sites. We looked at Confucius Institutes. We looked at content sharing partnerships. And similar to what we saw with the economics, there is clearly a subset of strategically important cities that matter to China most. Over half of these city level diplomacy ties were actually concentrated in just 16 cities in the entire region. And the highest intensity of these are focused towards places like Bishkek, Kazakhstan, or yeah, Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, and Kathmandu, Nepal. And more broadly, if you look at the attributes of what, what these cities kind of have in common, it's that uh, they're primarily national capitals, but they also hold economic importance as metropolitan areas that attract market opportunities for China. Okay, we also looked at social media um, as a new frontier for people-to-people -people diplomacy. And, and, you know, this is really a lot in the news right now because, you know, think about it, with a click of a virtual button, states can reach foreign publics at scale, and often with greater personal appeal than you can with traditional mass market media. What's interesting about China's use of Twitter is that, of course, Twitter is banned in China. And so this is actually a really interesting uh, lesson in state-backed propaganda or narrative shaping because the only Chinese-related accounts are state diplomats, state-run media outlets that have the tacit endorsement and blessing of the Chinese government to engage in using this channel. Um, and so we... Uh, we looked at um, not the messages themselves, but the ability that no matter what you're trying to promote, can you reach the networks of people that you want to? How well connected are you to the networks you want to reach? And so we looked at China's ability to reach a particular set of political, civil society, and private sector elites and government agencies in the region um, that really can be in a position to either directly make decisions that matter to Beijing or can indirectly influence their peers and leaders. And so we constructed a novel data set of active Twitter accounts associated with the individuals and organizations from these 12 countries that mattered and the PRC. Um, and we found that 
despite all of the stuff in the news that you read uh, about wolf warrior diplomacy, if you're tracking with that, fairly few of the region's elites actually follow or are followed by the 115 Chinese government affiliated accounts we looked at. And so what this means in practice, as you're reading the news and you're thinking about this, is that China's ability to influence narratives and connect with its desired target audiences on Twitter is highly contingent. And what I mean by that, it's contingent upon a relatively small number of brokers that serve as the connective tissues between China's accounts and the elites in these other countries. And they become really, they, they regain outsized importance. And so in the context of places like um, South Asia, this is heavily focused on a subset of very important politicians and journalists that become the nodes and the, that, that China uses to reach these networks. And in the context of Central Asia, it's fairly less, less um, diverse. It's, it's really these, these central government agencies that become very important. Um, I'm a little behind, but you can see some of these here and you can check out the report if you want. Um, perceptions, I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, so we know that there are many different uh, ways that, uh, that China or other foreign powers could sway popular opinion or leader behavior. Um, it could be that they're looking at shared history and cultural norms. It could be regional or global events that, or very intentional public diplomacy strategies. Um, and what we have seen in the past is that um, perceptions matter not only because that is a stated goal for China, reputational gains, kind of uh, re-winning the admiration of the world after something called the century of humiliation, but also that perceptions matter because they're instrumental to being able to achieve other goals that you have. Um, and so we looked at this in two different ways. We looked at citizen perceptions of China over, over a two decade period. Um, so whether citizens said that they approved of the job performance of your senior most leaders. And then we also looked at this uh, using uh, our in-house sampling frame called Listening to Leaders at Data, 100,000 leaders, 140 countries around the world, polling these leaders in government, in civil society, in the private sector about their attitudes and experience working with China and other actors. Um, and so just a few things to highlight here. Um, what's interesting is that you see, a different you see a different picture if you're asking citizens versus Leaders. So if you ask citizens what they think, citizens generally prefer Russia and China over um, uh, the US and India, um, but there is a little bit of difference. So there are some that are consistently favorable towards China, and this is pretty clearly true in Pakistan and Tajikistan, has really, really high uh, levels of favorability towards China. Then you have India, which is consistently unfavorable, which kind of makes sense if you think about this as this is a, a regional power that's jockeying for position. And then you have uh, the middle of the road. Um, and what's interesting, though, is this question of, OK, well, does favorability really matter? And does favorability tie in at all to what China is trying to do with its economic and soft power tools, all of those things that it's trying to use before? Um, and what we find is that it's a little bit of a, of a mixed bag. Um, so if you look at, uh, let's see, economic diplomacy, for example, um, you see that in some cases, it's actually associated with more favorable approval of China. And then other cases, it's, it's uh, associated with le less favorable approval of China. And so what's going on with that? And we found that it actually matters the strategy that China is employing. So in those countries, you remember I said before that there are some countries that seem to get more of a heavy emphasis on the economic diplomacy than soft power. It's those countries that actually have the clearest association with higher favorability towards Beijing. Um, that's not the case for the others. And then we also looked at this question of uh, uh, visits by high level leaders. And I can talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A. Just this question of does this President Xi Jinping showing up in your community, in your country, does that change the way that you think about China? Um, but what's interesting is that even though citizens had a greater preference for Russia and China, the opposite is true for uh, when you ask elites this question. So 70% of them surveyed were more favorable to uh, the US, for example, and India as compared to those favorable towards Russia and China. Um, but there was one important exception to that rule. So we asked a question because it was right around the time of the pandemic. And we said, OK, let's ask you about who did a better job adapting 
their public diplomacy, their soft power economic power overtures during the COVID-19 pandemic, who adapted best. And in this respect, it was China. Uh, that over a quarter, 28% of, of uh, elite surveyed said it was actually China that did the best job of adapting. Um, one of the things that we looked at, we drilled down on a little bit more is, well, what might be driving some of these perceptions of favorability? So when an elite says they, they favor China, why is that? And when they say they favor the US, why is that? And we gave them a, a bunch of different options that they could draw upon. And what's interesting is that for China and the US alike, the primary rationale is economic opportunity, that elites say they favor China when they see China as key to their economic opportunity moving forward. Um, there was also, though, a secondary important um, thing looking at people-to-people -people ties as well. And so quickly, because I want to make sure we have enough time for uh, interaction with you and anything that Brad and Mar and I could talk about this for days on end. We gave you kind of the top line, like uh, surface level stuff, but we want to have a, a conversation with you. But if I am thinking about trying to decode Beijing's playbook and think about this more broadly than just the regions that I talked about, what are some of the takeaways? And so one is that is my argument that Beijing cultivates narrow but deep corridors of power. China is not equally paying attention to every community and country in the same way and in the same level. They are really focused and concentrated and strategic in which communities matter most. The other thing, and this is why it's valuable, I think, to look at the economics and the soft power together. Uh, former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates wrote this book called Symphony of Power. So if you think about it, a symphony, if you have one instrument and it's playing, it can be beautiful. But what's powerful and resonant is when you have multiple instruments playing together on the same tune at the same time. And that's what China is doing with its foreign policy tools. It's taking those economic, the, those economic tools and that's driving interest in learning Mandarin and studying abroad. But when you're investing in those promotion tools of study, study abroad and exchange and the like, that's creating future markets for your goods and services and supplies. So there's this, this synergy and this reinforcing effort that China does really well. And then finally, I will say that um, Yes, economics and soft power go together, but what we see in the perceptions data is that it's easier said than done to get from economic and soft power activity to economic and soft power. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you all for questions and open it back up to Brad and Mar, but thank you so much. For the Big questions. And if you don't have questions but have things that you like, I disagree with that or I <laughs> love that, that's what we do. I just have a quick question. Uh, and that is uh, it seems like there's been an increasing commercialization of China's uh, overseas. I wonder if. Uh, uh, it seems like it's approaching foreign direct investment, you know, rather than simply uh, government aid. And is that, if that's the case, then uh, what is the percentage of China's total foreign direct investment that fits in your projects? And wouldn't a more comparable comparison to the United States or EU or whatever be the total FDI? Uh, rather than uh, OECD categories. I can, I can jump in on that. I, you know, so for, there's kind of two um, parts of the answer to that question. One is like, how do we ensure that we're making apples to apples comparisons? So kind of a methodological or measurement answer. And then there's more of like the, subs, the substantive answer. So from the methodological standpoint, um, FDI is not included in our definition of official sector financial flows because it's not included in the OECD's definition. So equity investments- It's not official, right? No, no, uh, it, it, it's official. It just doesn't count um, under the OECD's definition of uh, official development assistance or other official flows. So there's a lot of it coming from China, right? A lot of official sector, um, direct investment and portfolio investment. That is not included in our data set. Basically think of our data set as eight fine, 
aid financed or debt financed projects. Now, debt finance is often kind of a, a close cousin of equity, right? So a lot of these projects are um, blending debt and equity, and we're kind of um, expunging the equity component. So for example, you know, if you come in and finance a, um, a hydropower project, it's not uncommon to set up a project company or a special purpose vehicle. And let's say it's a billion dollar project, 80% will be financed with debt, 20% will be uh, equity from the project sponsors. So we would, only, in our data set, we would only capture the, the 80% um, and not the, the 20%. In terms of how these comparisons would look, um, if, if you were able to bring, say, um, Chinese FDI into the equation and uh, US FDI, we have not yet done that in a, in a systematic way. But I will say, uh, you know, we've, looked, we've seen uh, other studies that have tried to do that. Um, and in, the, at least in the poorest countries in the world, like if you do that in Africa, the US is still being outspent, <laughs> you know, by a long shot by, by China. And also, I would say that uh, if you think of the political economy of this and how it works in some of these developing countries, the one, one model that I've heard is that these official flows that we've talked about are supposed to help set the groundwork for floodgates of private FDI coming in through special economic zones, et cetera. So if you supply energy, you give better connectivity. In theory, these special economic zones are now um, going to attract more private sector FDI inflows from China. Whether that theory actually works on the ground or not, um, at least in South Asia, is yet to be seen. But that's also another avenue where this private public and government to private discussion becomes a little bit, a uh, little bit muddled. Because in in Pakistan, for example, I hear a lot of this term called G to G and P to P. So they're trying to keep it like. There's government to government, there's private to private, but whether that actually that model of step by step um, official finance, public infrastructure, then private works, I think we'll have to see in the years ahead. Oh, thank you for doing this amazing work. And it's um, where can we get this um, reports? Yeah, so if you go to adata.org, the website, uh, yeah, you can, there's a whole treasure trove of data you can find, and then all of our reports are publicly. Yeah. adata.org slash China, where you find basically all of this. Yeah, this is really amazing. And I'm just looking at, um, you know, particularly Sam, your synthetic analysis of the data, um, looking at your three takeaways in the playbook. Um, isn't this the same playbook that they're Europe and America used in the past 300 years? I get asked that question all the time. And I think that in some respects it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you think about foreign aid in the US since the 1960s. Student exchange. A relationship that. that's positive. Yeah, so, so there's definitely um, similarities in terms of the types of tools that might be used and also similarity in terms of the types of aims right so the us is rather explicit about the fact that yes it does have humanitarian aims for its economic existence but sure. it also has national security aims it has how do these different aims. so there are similarities and that's why you know i think when you look at china you also need to look at what's well, what's russia doing and what's the us doing and all these I will say there are some differences, though, in my opinion, and perhaps Amar and Brad would agree. You know, I think one is that um, just the scale of what we're talking about, that $3.3 trillion just continues to boggle my mind mm -hmm. in terms of the, 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 the resource envelope that can be supplied on the economic side. And then you pair that with the fact that you have uh, decades of industrial policies that have allowed China to effectively create this over capacity, excess capacity in its steel construction and um, transport industries. So taken together, there's a need for China to push out a lot of this to be able to quell potential unrest at home and get a good return because there's not sufficient domestic absorption capacity. So that's a little unique. The other thing that might be unique, I think, is on the soft power side, you think about the fact that I hear regularly from US policymakers that 
lament the fact that the US government feels like it has no control over Voice of America, Radio Free Asia. Why are they blasting the US? We need to really tell them to say what we want them to say. And that's because there are congressional protections in place that limit, even though Voice of America is funded by the US government, there are limits on what it can say. In the context of China, you have a substantial number of state-run media operations, and then even, even uh, unaffiliated uh, media receive information from the Chinese government in terms of what they're allowed to say or not to say, use these terms, not these terms. And so I think that level of control on the message is unique to China as well. Um, and I think that you know the other thing that I often hear is that a lot of certainly there are non-governmental aspects to China's public diplomacy overtures, just as there are in the context of the U.S. But what um, when I when I interview leaders in other countries when when they're trying to compare the U.S. versus China, for example, they'll say, you know, China, you have all of these voices and they're kind of singing the same tune. And the benefit of that is coherence. The challenge is that it seems like propaganda and people don't trust it. Opposite is true for the US where you have all of these voices and they're kind of singing all over the place. And, and so, you know, po political leaders are lamenting the lack of coherence, but it is seen as a little bit more trustworthy. So I think similarities and differences. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm just going to add one more thing about your first, I agree with you with the, the, the two, you know, second and third difference. The first one seems to be also a kind of, like it's its own, it, it is the logic of capital, you know, but it's like what Karl Marx has been saying, or no, not has been said, said you know, uh, the displacement, you know, mm -hmm. and, and someone like, you know, David Harvey would be saying the same thing, that, that in that sense, the movements of capital as it the excess capacity going to other places to seek profit mm -hmm. is identical in, uh, you know, in, in many places. Absolutely, but the U.S. doesn't have a three point three trillion dollar reserve. Well, the size, yeah, the size <laughs> doesn't change the nature of the logic, right? Yeah, that's, yeah. I think that's absolutely right. The other thing I forgot to mention that we should go over here is um, perhaps another difference to think about is um, the cyclical nature of our political cycle here in the mm -hmm. U.S. makes for greater incoherence at least from the perception of other countries in terms of what our priorities are and what we're standing for. Whereas uh, some may argue whether or not China actually has a hundred year plan or a long game. There's a lot of debate over this, but they, they do have the benefit of having a little bit fewer of these political cycles. Well, actually it's uh, related to this question, but I, I disagree that actually there's a lot more similarity with the USA and China because of one important thing, I didn't quite get it. And so this is my question. So it's a great question to add on to my question, which is there's things that China does that blends equity and debt. And then there's things China does that's, that's that blends state owned enterprise and private. Mm -hmm. So all of this makes it, magnifies it, makes it huge. And you can't tell what's debt, what's equity. And you can't tell what's state owned and what's private. Mm -hmm. So then my question is, that's why it's so big. It's much more similar in my view to Japan's uh, aid and yet it's still still Japan in that model that China now has is still so small compared to what China can do in harnessing the power of the private sector. So my question is when you talked about the parallel contracts, it's fascinating to me. So when you have a contract that is um, financing and then you have a parallel commodity contract, those contracts are entered into by other kinds of companies, not the same banks that are lending. So um, in your data, if I go online to look at your data, which I haven't yet for a while, um, do you distinguish between different organizations that are doing this yet yeah, these contracts to doing uptake agreements and then the lending and then in default situations, the contingency, the asset management company, how detailed do you go into the private, public, semi-private, semi-public companies in your data set? Can I find that? Yeah, so um, quite detailed. Um, so every transaction has the primary financing institution and then the um, not only the initial uh, borrower, but if the, uh, the proceeds of the loan are on lent, any of the on lending to subsidiary entities is also recorded. Then when you have um, these kind of uh, third parties that are um, connected 
to that lending relationship. So this would be Cinesure provides uh, credit insurance or um, someone comes in and provides a corporate repayment guarantee or the government comes in and provides a sovereign guarantee or um, an entity says we're pledging our 10% equity stake in this mine as a source of collateral that you can seize in the event of default. All of those organizations are captured by name and then they're categorized by type and by country of origin, right? So you can sort of uh, map out the network of all the organizations that are involved in these transactions. That's on the kind of quantitative side, like you can get that kind of systematically in an Excel spreadsheet. Then you have these very thick descriptions of the transactions and um, the, the descriptions also kind of explain how all these relationships work. So for example, if in the example, in the um, collateralized uh, lending example that you alluded to, what this would look like in the project description is there would be a description of what was the day on which the loan was issued from the lender to the borrower. What was the amount, the currency of the denomination, the pricing of the loan. But then there, the next paragraph would say, on the same day that the loan agreement was signed, Sinopec, a Chinese state-owned oil company, signed a, a commodity sales and purchase agreement with the Congolese state-owned oil company. And they agreed to sell them this much oil at these prices for the next 20 years. And there's a four-party agreement that links the commodity sales agreement with the loan agreement. And here's how the loan gets repaid. When the, when the commodity is sold, the money is deposited in this bank account that facilitates the repayment of the loan. So the quantitative information in the data set and the qualitative are kind of um, close cousins or like they're, you know, to really get the analytical value out of the data set, you kind of have to use them in tandem. And, and Paolo, so to, to, if I could add on, push a bit, I can't wait to go see the data set. Have you studied the default in, in detail? And uh, you said two dozen of them are, have buyer's remorse. Uh, are most of them related to default or restructuring? Or is it just sort of before that hits, they've already ha started having remorse because of other pressure? Uh, so the data set um, captures, there's a, there's a variable called flow. And so flow captures, is it a grant? Is it a loan? Is it an export credit? Is it technical assistance? Is it uh, scholarships? Then there's one category called uh, debt rescheduling, right? So there are about 250 or 300 uh, reschedulings. And you can think of reschedulings. There's a new paper out uh, just a month ago, the World Bank's chief economist, Carmen Reinhart, put out a paper called Hidden Defaults. And it is based on this data set. And her argument is that uh, you know, it's very costly for sovereigns to say, hey, I'm defaulting. Hey, everyone's going to jack up the price of borrowing, right? You don't want to do that. So you want to default uh, sort of discreetly, right? And so they use um, hard rescheduling data as kind of a tacit acknowledgement that you can't repay your loans, <laughs> right? If you've actually gotten through a rescheduling. So the data there tell you, it precisely how the loan was rescheduled. Did they extend the grace period? Did they extend the maturity? You know, did they, uh, how did they adjust the interest rate? And that is a treasure trove. And I think what you'll find if you dig into the data is that they generally take a portfolio approach to rescheduling. So they're not gonna come in and just reschedule one loan. They're gonna do a package of loans and there's gonna be a lot of horse trading. So I'm gonna, on these, so for example, they, they did a en masse rescheduling of $2 billion of debt with Congo Brazzaville. There are eight loans. One of the eight loans was worth a billion dollars. The other seven was worth another billion dollars. For the seven worth the first billion dollars, they provided quite generous terms. And if you put it through like standard calculators, it kind of looked like a Paris Club uh, rescheduling. You then do it for the big ticket loan, the $1 billion loan, and they didn't take a haircut, they took a reverse haircut. They came out $300 million wealthier. <laughs> and so they're thinking about the big picture, right? They're doing the net present value calculation of these loans. And so they're quite savvy about the way that they, uh, about the way that they reschedule. So short answer is 
um, defaults are happening, but they are happening um, in sort of opaque ways. If I get that one more, does, does China agree? Have you been receiving in, um, feedback from Beijing as to your study? Because they have theirs. I often look at, for example, AIIB releases some things, all the things that they do, and they have their own data set that they show. What feedback have you gotten from Beijing directly about they want you to show smaller or bigger? <laughs> yeah, so we have, it's uh, hard to answer that concisely because we produce a lot of data and a lot of reports and the, their responses to our data and reports are heterogeneous. <laughs> so sometimes we put out report, you know, we are sort of dyed in the wool empiricists. And so sometimes we put out reports and they like the results and therefore they send a delegation to Williamsburg to come and look, learn about the findings or they retweet it. And then other studies, you know, we find something that they don't consider to be favorable and, you know, they will put out a press release or through a spokesperson say, you know, we disagree with these findings or they will commission uh, with, re with respect to the, not quarters of power, but banking on the Belden Road, they um, quietly commissioned uh, an academic um, to write an op-ed for the Global Times, <laughs> you know, sort of uh, challenging uh, the report. I think in general, they, uh, you know, they have to manage domestic political pressures, right? So if, if you look at public, the few public opinion surveys that are out there in China about their overseas spending, what it shows is the same thing that you see in the US which is generally low support for overseas spending and the lowest level support among uh, poor provinces and provinces with high levels of unemployment, right? So when a, when a report comes out that says, you know, China's got this sprawling empire of overseas financial entanglements that creates some, it, it uh, sort of instigates some anxieties, I think, about, uh, you know, wh whether we are being sufficiently attentive to our domestic audience. I mean, there was a very um, uh, high profile instance of this where there were some school buses um, in China where they crashed. There were some children that died. This is about 2011. And a week, a week later or a week before, China donated a batch of school buses to the government of Montenegro. And it led to um, Chinese citizens getting extremely upset and being vocal about it, right? And China went onto its back foot. It went on defense, <laughs> you know? And I think they were chastened from that experience. So I think they, um, they are very much uh, sort of screening research, new analysis and data to say, you know, is this, does this help us or hurt us with the audiences that we care about? Maybe I'll add to, to um, your question, because Brent talked about it primarily from what China is doing and how it's, it's reevaluating things. From the perspective of recipient countries, there's a couple of different like, avenues that I have seen uh, kind of the, the remorse set in, one of which is from the government itself. So this can either be because of just difficulties repaying <laughs> the debts, um, but also, uh, there's a number of instances where, because China is being responsive to uh, what political leaders want to do, um, there are assumptions that are sometimes made, especially if the financial terms are loans, that, okay, there will be enough revenue coming in from this asset to offset that and we can pay it. And so what can happen is a, is a context like Malaysia, where there was too many investments in port projects, that there was overcapacity of ports relative to the demand on these things, so the revenues weren't materializing. And I think that that creates a, a difficulty. So the lack of revenue coming in, the difficulty repaying. But then the other two uh, strands that I've seen, one is um, the political opposition kind of latching onto the, the opacity of these terms. This is why you know the data that Brad and Mark talked about are so important because it takes so much work to get because China doesn't release this information. And so that creates an opportunity for political opposition, you know, in places like the Maldives, where I was a few years ago, where um, there were spats on Twitter between the Chinese ambassador and the political opposition about China's motives and uh, all of this, this debt that the country was taking on. And that became a galvanizing issue that allowed the political opposition to take power. 
And you've seen that in other places like Sri Lanka and Malaysia as well. So, so that is one. Um, and then the third is public sentiment. I was talking with um, Phil Potter from the public policy group earlier. And so you can see this come out where um, opposition to Chinese labor, opposition to displacement from Chinese projects, uh, and the like, and if that creates enough pressure on the government that can change things. So those are the, the three areas I've seen. Yeah. Yes. Can I ask about the, um, the hidden debt from the first presentation? So um, in, in reading the report, it seems like um, there's some ambiguity in terms of coding something that's, that's considered hidden debt. Because in terms of projects where there's an implicit um, host government repayment guarantee, you know, there's, it's a, a, an open question as to whether the, the government will, will decide to take on that payment. So is, is that potentially, if, if all of those projects are considered hidden debt, is that potentially overstating, uh, you know, the, the headline figure? And then the, the second part is kind of, is there kind of evidence about, you, you mentioned that there were some projects that have already, you know, there was an implicit host government repayment guarantee and the government decided to take it over unexpectedly. Um, is, is there any evidence as to kind of whether a, a government is more likely to take on a certain project? So uh, something that's important to understand about the international reporting system for debt is that your obligation as a government, if you participate in the debtor reporting system, is not to disclose your actual repayment obligations. It's to disclose your actual and potential repayment obligations. So our estimate of underreported debt aligns with that definition, right? So let me give you a concrete example to help you understand why this matters. So take the Laos, the, uh, Laos China Railway. So this is like a truly ambiguous situation in terms of like, if things go south, who is going to repay the loan, right? So they think about this, they set up a special purpose vehicle. It's called the Laos China Railway Company. It is a joint venture, okay? 70% owned by Chinese state-owned companies, 30% owned by a Lao state-owned company, okay? So that's a limited liability corporation. Why do you create a limited liability corporation? You do it to limit your liability. <laughs> Meaning, if that company fails, if it, go, if it becomes insolvent or it goes bankrupt, then you can theoretically walk away, right? That's the allure of setting up these joint ventures or special purpose vehicles. The problem is when you set up these, these types of entities to finance a public infrastructure asset. Because a public infrastructure asset, what we know from the history of government bailouts is that the determining factor for whether the government steps in to kind of uh, assume responsibility for the repayment of a debt for a public infrastructure asset, that is a function of political pressure and public pressure, like public pressure from taxpayers or voters. In, in other words, to make this very concrete, this in, in Laos, they take out a three and a half billion dollar loan, right? And the government says, we have a 30% ownership stake in the joint venture. Under international reporting rules, we only have to disclose it as a government, a potential government repayment obligations if we have at least a 50% ownership stake. So very convenient. Right? There's a lot of this strategic selection of your ownership stake below the 50% threshold, right? So their, their point is, look, if this thing goes belly up, we can walk away, right? But the reality of it is that um, your ability to walk away depends on whether other politicians or a creditor is going to pressure you to step in as the host government to assume responsibility for that debt. So if people think the railway or the road is sufficiently important. Sometimes they will say, we, need, you know, we can't let, this, this thing's too big to fail, right? Um, we can't walk away. Now, if you have the, the sort of intestinal fortitude to say, nope, that's a stranded asset. I'm walking away the half, I mean, that's like what Kazakhstan's doing. They build a high-speed uh, railway, downtown uh, Astana, you know, it ended up being a white elephant, they're walking away, right? 
Um, they're letting the, the joint venture go belly up. And that's why in the report, we talk about this hidden debt as being kind of a phantom menace. And what we mean by phantom menace is if you put yourself in the shoes of a finance ministry, the problem is not that there's, that you know there's hidden debt and you're not disclosing it to people. The problem is that you don't know how much you are actually on the hook for, right? That's why it's like, you're trying to slay this menace and you don't know how big or small it is because you know if that loud if that loud china railway goes belly up maybe who knows maybe the chinese government they have a, a chinese state owned enterprises they have a 70% ownership stake maybe they're on the hook maybe it's so important to them that they're going to provide the bailout in which case there's no hidden public debt for the government of laos or it might go the other way maybe uh, you know China's willing to walk away and the Laotians are not willing to walk away. So they're, so the, this is the nature of the problem, right? The, the Laotian government doesn't know their, their level of obligation under that loan could be as low as zero or as much as $3.5 billion, right? And it's that uncertainty that has Moody's and S&P and the others pulling their hair out saying, we don't know, you know, what the public debt obligations are of the host government precisely because um, the ownership arrangements of the borrowing institutions um, don't sort of spell this out. Like when, basically when an LLC goes bankrupt, all bets are off, right? Then really the determining factor for who repays is who cares the most about the public infrastructure assets. Yes. It seems to me that the word obligation here is problematic then because obligation is not a requirement of to repay at a particular level, otherwise you're in default. It's a question of, of what you lose if you don't step in, uh, either politically, domestically, or from the asset itself. Yeah, I think that's fair. That's why all the reporting standards say you need to disclose your actual and potential repayment obligations. Yeah, but obligations that is still, to me, obligation uh, seems to me to be a strong word. It seems to be not just a question of whether people are going to bring their begging bowl to you and it's to your interest to contribute, uh, but uh, that if you don't contribute, you're under the uh, you're under a sovereign default or something. Yeah, I think that, no, I think it's fair. I mean, a lot of people think the, the equity stakes in the joint venture or the special purpose vehicle is how you determine who is responsible for how much debt repayment. And that's just not how it works. <laughs> like if you go into bankruptcy, they don't say it's 70% owned by China, 30% owned by Laos. And so Laos take 30% of the $3.5 million debt no, in an insolvency situation, that entity ceases to exist and technically no one is responsible, <laughs> right? So that's the, when the dispositive factor is who cares the most about the asset. Can I ask a follow-up question? So it, is the, I know the, the China Last Railway Project is, is in the report. Yes. Is that kind of representative of hidden debt projects? I mean, I, I know it's like, a very large scale. It's like a high percentage of, you know, Laos's GDP. Um, is it representative of the larger sample of, of hidden debt? So set, something to keep in mind, just as like an important descriptive statistic is from the time BRI starts at the end of 2013 forward, 70% of debt being issued from China to overseas lenders is not to sovereign governments. It's to some combination of state-owned enterprises in the host country, state-owned banks, special purpose vehicles, joint ventures, or private sector institutions. And then across those borrowers, you have all kinds of different types of liability protection, some more explicit, some implicit, but in many cases, the host government owns an equal, has an equal stake in the borrowing institution or a minority stake. So the, like the arrangement with Laos is quite common. 30, 70, 60, 40, uh, some split like that is, is kind of generally representative. But right now, 
tw like tw 33% of all overseas lending from China is now going to special purpose vehicles. So this is not like a, a phenomenon that we can kind of say, oh, it's, it's trivial. I mean, it's becoming a, a main feature of how they, how they operate, how they do big ticket infrastructure projects. So the, the one, one thing that you mentioned with the Estro account, I thought that was, so I read the Financial Times uh, article where you and both uh, about it, but so again, it follows from Shicha's point that he was making. Is it only China that's doing it? Because one of the points that Rottingham makes in that article is that she gives an example of a project in Liberia where the project was financed by USAID and the repayment, uh, you know, whatever terms were, were sort of what an escrow account was, and they were much more stringent than what China was following. So then the question becomes, and that sort of follows from whatever Beijing would say, that it's, you know, this is just a way to tarnish uh, China's image. So then doesn't it sort of making it comparative in that context with other, you know, sort of established powers, the way that they function as far as external financing is concerned, doesn't that make the research more objective? Uh, you know, in many ways. And then the second point is, again, from his point, the point that you were making in the US sort of doing things different, which sort of follows once again from David Harvey and Marx's work. Uh, is it that the, you know, logic of capitalism that capital is going to flow towards area where it wants to maximize its returns? So then be it state-owned enterprises or not state-owned enterprises, especially the state-owned enterprises that China has, which are explicitly uh, listed on the market. Then if you're listed on the market, then at the end of the day, you are there to maximize returns. So then, you know, it's it's not very different from what any other, uh, you know, profit maximizing corporation would do. So two questions, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to start with the first one. I, I think the comparison to Liberia is not the right one. So that was not a loan, that was a grant, and it was in a very specific historical context. This is right after Liberia came out of a civil war. Um, their governance was extremely weak. And what happened was the IMF and USAID placed financial controllers in the Ministry of Finance and gave them signature authority over major expenditures going through the, the finance ministry. So I think Deborah's point was, look, you know, Western and multilateral institutions are not above <laughs> being uh, uh, sort of intrusive in the way that they uh, try to manage the affairs of the borrowing institution. Um, and I think the comparison in that um, the, that particular story in the Financial Times that you're referring to was about the Entebbe yeah. uh, International yeah. Airport. Yeah. And I think in that case, what we found is like, the thing is China's, lending into very risky environments, very, much riskier places than uh, most Western creditors and multilateral creditors. And so we see them taking sort of extraordinary risk mitigation me measures. So in that particular case, um, you know, they asked for a bunch of things. Um, one, they asked for, um, they asked for about $17 million in an escrow account that they could uh, seize in a moment's notice. They asked for uh, spending approval authority over Uganda's principal international airport for 20 years. So they could sort of veto any decisions the airport was taking. And I think, you know, uh, her point was there are others playing this game. I don't think that is true um, in, the, in the lending space. Um, and we have this kind of uh, companion study that we released called How China Lends, where we compare 100 Chinese loan contracts to about 250 contracts from other bilateral, multilateral, and commercial creditors. We don't see them asking, for, uh, the non-Chinese creditors asking for uh, collateral. Um, you know, we don't see some of the more intrusive policy conditions. But the flip side of that coin is the stakes are lower for them. They're, low, they're lending smaller sums to less risky countries, <laughs> right? So I think the, the repayment safeguards that are in these Chinese loans are certainly 
larger because the stakes are larger for, for China. Um, yeah, building on that, a lot in your question, I'm gonna try to tease out. So the first thing is, um, I'm gonna pick up on something that Brad shared with a class that I, and I, I reinforce it with my class. Yeah, I think you can tell a lot about um, China's intent with the way that it's deploying its finances. And one of the things that Brad's talked about is if you look at um, the terms and you look at, so so if you look at a generosity from like grants that are you know given away or low or no interest loans on the one hand to these loans approaching market rates on the other hand, you know, what kind, under what conditions is China giving away money for free versus under what conditions is it trying to get a good return? And the types of projects that you most often see get the grants and the lower note interest loans are like the stadiums and the, you know, the cultural uh, things and the schools, um, things that are high visibility that for China, there is an additional objective there to be able to build goodwill to be seen as generous. But the types of projects that most often get the, um, the approaching market rates are things like you know, a mining project in Kazakhstan that, you know, there is an expected return on that investment. So, you know, I think we have to be careful with saying, okay, profit maximization is not always the primary objective. Um, second, I would say is that there's a little bit of a difference in terms of how China approaches, um, how it deploys its financing relative to the U.S. And so the reason I say that, I don't think you guys said this in your talk, but China uses this approach of circular lending, where um, you know it's tying the promise of financing for implementation of a project to the use of Chinese firms for implementation and supplies from China for implementation. And so the money never actually leaves the, the country in, in the sense. And certainly that there is the practice of tied aid in the in the context of the use, but in the US, but if you look at the number of implementers of Chinese-backed uh, development projects that are Chinese firms, that, that percentage is way higher than what you would see. So that's a little bit different as well. Um, I also think it's interesting, you know, I think I was talking to you earlier about, you know, the benefit of reading Chinese scholars and their analyses of things. And I read one that was fairly recent and it was talking about implementation of BRI and engagement of Chinese firms in implementation. And they said that the, the hope from the government was actually to crowd in not only state-owned enterprises, but the private sector. But if you look at which firms are actually primarily doing the implementation, it's almost almost always state-owned firms. So you know, I think that there's an like if it was truly a profit profit maximization opportunity, wouldn't the private sector be jumping on that? Um, so you know, I agree with you that we want to be careful of saying. Oh, China is dealing entirely differently and dissimilarly to, to the U.S. because I think, you know, the U.S. too has a profit motive, but I think it's a little bit more nuanced for I have a quick question because uh, Brian, you mentioned that the, the, interest, the interest rate is like 4% or 1%. Yes. Is yes. So high, and you know, why anybody would want to take that? I think the big reason is that uh, what they're lending for. So the Western lenders and the multilateral lenders, for the most part, have shifted out of infrastructure. This is like a long-standing trend. They're lending for things like governance projects, social protection. You know, uh, not they've re infrastructure. really backed out of infrastructure, and China has stepped into the breach, and particularly for very large. Uh, infrastructure projects worth worth uh, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. No choice, you know. Yeah, I mean they've uh, they've looked around and said who's willing to fund projects that large, and China's the only one. And the reason why China's willing to do that is because they have all these surplus dollars and euros. And you know, for a long time before the global financial crisis, they parked most of those excess dollars in U.S. Treasuries. And they were getting a pretty meager return after um, quantitative easing happened. So they're getting about one to 2%. So there's this very consequential agreement that was signed between the central bank in China, PBOC, and the, the state-owned banks. They signed an entrust agreement where they entrusted 
their excess dollars and they said, go get me better than, get me a better rate of return than what I'm getting in US treasuries. And so that's when these banks went hunting, right? They became yield maximizing surrogates of the state. They're on the hunt for bankable revenue generating projects, which is why, you know, they uh, lend like a, they act like a commercial lender, <laughs> right? And I think that's one of the things that is um, really hard for people to get their, their heads around because kind of Western lenders and multilateral lenders, they're not lending, they're not in that yield maximizing uh, mode. In fact, they have a mandate from their political principles to provide subsidized credit. They have a, you know, they're being told you need to think a lot about uh, the sovereign, the debt sustainability of your borrower countries. They're not getting any guidance about the Chinese corner of the market. Could have been, could have, they have asked for, I don't know, five or six percent. I don't know. They do. They do in some cases in risky, really risky places. I mean, they they adjust the interest rate based on how risky it is. So if it's Equatorial Guinea, they'll ask for a king's ransom. It'll be six, seven, eight percent. But just like Citibank would do, right? They're going to assess risk and the margin. You know, it's a floating market interest rate, and then your margin is uh, based on the risk assessment. So it's no. The, I think the thing that's different is it's the state that's involved. We don't bat an eye when Citibank does this, <laughs> but when we see state-owned institutions doing this, performing the same, same functions, that sort of spins our heads. <laughs> yeah, in addition to the dearth of supply, which is most often the case because China is often the only game in town. It's also interesting though, to look at cases where China is not the only game in town. And you know, I, when I was doing my field work in the Philippines, for example, there were actually Japanese in uh, loans on the offer for yes. like less than one percent interest rate versus a Jap versus a Chinese loan, which was like approaching market rates, and they went with the Chinese loan, and you're like, why are you why are you doing this? And in interviewing you know officials that were kind of tied into those negotiations, they said, well, you've got to look at the bigger picture. You can't just look at this one agreement. And the reason they said that is because China had put in a bunch of sweeteners alongside that. So export markets for Philippines bananas, guaranteed amounts of tourist revenue dollars because they can put the Philippines on a preferred list uh, for Chinese tourists. And so, you know, when you think about it that way, there are these other sweeteners in the mix as well. And of course, the people signing these loans in many cases are politicians, not technocrats. And so when you sign a loan agreement, it has a seven year grace period that's free. It's as good as a grant. <laughs> right? That's somebody else. I, I'll be so lucky if I'm still in power seven years from now. <laughs> right? So whether it's a 4% interest rate or a 1% interest rate, that's my successor's problem. Something selfish. Do you have any data for real estate as a category? Um, from architecture. Lending for real, real estate, estate projects? There, there are real estate projects um, yeah, in your data. It's, it's sort of unfortunately, there's not a OECD sector. This is one of these cases where, because the state is involved, the actual measurement criteria have assumed the way uh, the relevance of certain categories. So the OECD doesn't even have a sector code for real estate because the sector codes were created for, you know, government donors and lenders. Why would they ever be involved in real estate, <laughs> right? But we do. The short answer is we do have. Um, rows in the data set that are loans for, you know, building a hotel, luxury hotels in the Caribbean that are financed by the Chinese. Churches and uh, residential developments that are beginning to transform cityscapes and that we yes. yes. look at, and, you know, we really need to understand a little bit more. Yes. Um, so they asked my PhD students to go and figure out that the, the, the description field that Brad talked about, uh, we do a lot of that, you know, yes. search for terms. If you can have your graduate students like come up with fifteen terms that are related to real estate, yeah. Yeah. hotel, residence, yes. luxury, yeah, yeah. you come up with a bag of words, and then you can quickly isolate the universe of projects that the, relate to real estate. It's amazing that Chinese urbanization had, you know, had been or has been driven by real estate in the past three decades. 
uh, through residential high-rise developments, and that's kind of replicated almost like in parts of Africa. And there, I will tell you in advance, they're not all they're not all commercial transactions. So you would think the the real estate ones would just be the state's not involved, um, but there's a lot of cases where the borrower is a so the Maldives, they built that luxury $127 million loan to a private individual to build a luxury hotel on an atoll yeah. with a sovereign guarantee, <laughs> yeah. right? So if the, and the person who got the loan was a friend of the president. So he got the loan, but the government is on the hook to repay the loan for the, the private hotel um, in the event that, that it goes south. And guess what? It did go south. So it became a government repayment obligation. Well, the biggest developments in China, the government owned them. Yeah, it's not all private, so it's a mix. It's interesting to see how that plays out in, in Africa. China, Jake, last question. Okay, last. Well, it seems to me that what you're describing in China's funding of these uh, developing country projects, both by type, uh, unavailable money elsewhere by type, infrastructure, or by uh, the degree of risk in the place. Uh, it's uh, creating something that's quite different from the American hub and spoke type of political economy, but it's like hub and rim. There's the places beyond uh, the, you know, the uh, remaining uh, interest of Western capitalism mm -hmm. in uh, investment. Uh, and yet still, it's a significant part of the world's population. Sig needless to say, significant infrastructure needs. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamentally different pattern of hub and rim versus hub and spoke, where you have the, the more a substantial government to government relationship and alliance-based system rather than uh, uh, simply a project base. So thank you very much. Join me in thanking you.